Oh, and so Stu, thanks again um, for taking the time. I, I know you're busy with the MLS Cup playoffs, and and we have the World Cup here starting um, in a couple of weeks. Just, you know, how would you describe the state of the the U.S. national team? Uh, which is a tough question to start with, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> to kick off this interview. But you know, I, I know U.S. is coming off some not so convincing um, kind of pre World Cup tune ups here. So, you know, how are we looking heading into the World Cup in a couple of weeks? I, I think we're feeling a little uneasy about, you know, how this is going to go. I mean, the, the, the important part is that we're back at a World Cup for the first time now in eight years. And that was the main goal for this team coming into this cycle was to get themselves back in a position to be back at a World Cup, which as American soccer fans and as a, an American soccer nation, it's that's the baseline expectation is to be at a World Cup. So you check that box. I think there's a lot to be excited about about this team on an individual basis. You look at guys, and we've talked about it now for a couple of years, the maturation of this group, uh, young players playing at Chelsea, at Borussia Dortmund, at AC Milan, at Juventus, at some of the biggest clubs in the world. And I think that gets people excited and starting to talk about, well, this could be one of the most talented generations that we've had. Now, in saying that, we will be the youngest team at the World Cup by a pretty long shot. I think Ecuador will be the second youngest. So that means you have a lot of inexperience. 95% of the roster, this will be their first time at a World Cup. That will present some challenges. And then the second part, and in, in one of the challenging parts of this tournament is that because the World Cup has shifted to the winter, it's smack dab in the middle of a season now for all these players that are playing in Europe. And a lot of guys are picking up injuries. Some of our key guys, uh, Gio Reyna's had three, four months out with injuries. Weston McKinney now has picked up an injury and he might not be back healthy a couple days before the World Cup. Josh Sargent's another one. I mean, the list goes on and on. I could list them all off. And I think that's the concern for me when I think about this team. The last round of matches, as you mentioned, wasn't good. They lost to Japan. They tied Saudi Arabia. They pick up the different types of injuries. I don't think we know who our starting keeper is, our starting center back and our starting forward. So outside from that, everything's great. Uh, but, you know, tournaments and, and World Cups are are weird like that. Like, you know, this one to, to my right here was the one that I played in South Africa 2010. And we went in with a group that was, you know, in different in a way. But then also when you get into this tournament setting and this feel, it all starts to change. And, and you really focus on the task at hand, which is game, training game. And you get immersed in that experience. And my hope is that that first game, this team turns up and everybody forgets what's happened for the last three, four months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to say what, what's kind of the biggest concerns for us heading into this tournament. And you named about 10 of them. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot, you know, but you know, we're not the only team that, that has these concerns. I, I look around uh, in and starting to do some of the prep now for, for the world cup, because I'm leaving in 10 days, which is crazy to think about that. It's getting so close now. And we're now 19 days before the start of the tournament. And you know, the, the, every team has injuries. Every team has question marks. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest storylines heading into this World Cup is who can handle all of that, who has the deepest roster, who can manage all the substitutions and really get contributions, maybe not from your key stars that you would be expecting. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like it's going to be a war of attrition, especially with it shifting from summer to now fall slash winter. It seems every other day I see, you know, someone on the France national team is, is, is getting hurt or isn't going to play with Conte and Pogba and just they're falling apart too, as I'm sure a lot of other nations. So it's just kind of, who literally is going to be standing, you know, at the <laughs> yeah, end of this tournament, exactly, we're yeah. probably going to win it. <laughs> so, so realistically, all of that stuff aside, and again, we know we have the roster reveal coming out, you know, next week, we're in group B with England, Iran, and Wales. Realistically, you know, how do we fare in this tournament? I think as, as a U.S. fan, you should expect your team to get out of the group. And we're in a group with Wales, Iran, and England. The Wales game, I maintain, is the most important game of all of them because that's the one that starts your tournament November 21st and a team that I think that we should beat. Wales uh, have had a couple of good runs at big tournaments. You go back to the Euros in, in 2016, 20, you know, for them, this is a group that has Gareth Bale, Aaron Ramsey, you know, like some, some household names that have been at some big clubs as well. But in saying that, I still feel that on paper, the United States are a more talented team. They're a more complete team. They're a more dynamic team. And it's also a team that I think that we should win in that first game. If you win that first game, you get three points. You're rolling into England on Black Friday, November 25th, which we expect to be the highest watched men's soccer game of all time. And, you know, it, it's one that should have a lot of excitement. You're playing against a top five team in the world. You're playing against a team that is expected to win the World Cup potentially. 
They got to the semifinals in 2018 and the finals of the Euros in the 2020. So, look, it, the U.S., it's going to be difficult, though. But that first game, if, you, if they beat Wales, I think that they could tie England potentially. And the, my biggest question marks, again, outside of the injuries on all that, it's the defense is – you know, I think that we're going to score goals. I think we have talented attacking players. I think we have a powerhouse midfield, but I wonder defensively, you know, with our center back partnership that I couldn't even tell you who that's going to be today, that what, what, what that looks like on the first game and what type of understanding and relationship to those guys to, to help this team get a result. But yeah, that, that, that should be the expectation. And I think the hope uh, that, that the U S team gets out of the group. Exactly. Fingers crossed, right, for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see. Uh, you, you know, you touched on the 2010 World Cup. You got the poster there right behind you. And like you said, a, a lot of these guys are coming into this tournament. This is their this is their first time, right? So, so talk about your experience. And I know I think you're coming off of a, a broken leg or an injury, and you really busted your butt, you know, to get back and rehab in time for that World Cup. So what was that experience like for you? And, you know, what, what's maybe your advice to a lot of these guys who are making their World Cup debuts to not maybe have the moment be too big for them, yeah. especially given like we were talking about the magnitude of the match against England. Yeah, 100%. I, I was with my brother last night, uh, trick-or-treating, uh, and, you know, was just thinking about that moment. We started talking about World Cups, and I was reminiscing about my experience and thinking about some of these current players that are picking up injuries, maybe now trying to avoid getting injured because – the World Cup is what every player dreams of, male, female. You, you want to play in a World Cup uh, it, it, when you when you grow up. Like what, A, when you're a little kid, you want to be a professional soccer player. B, you want to play in a World Cup. Like that, those are the two things that you talk about doing. So to achieve that dream for me, but then also in the march ahead of the World Cup, how close that was to being taken away from me because I broke my leg in a friendly against Holland. And I did have that moment where I thought this might be over for me. And then it quickly shifted my mindset back to the fact of, hey, do everything that you can do to get on that field. Do all the recovery you can do. Doctors told me that my timeline was going to match up. I was eating well. I was sleeping well. I was in the gym. My habits were good. Like I didn't miss a single second because I had that carrot that I was driving towards every single day. And I know all these guys will have the same because I knew I didn't want to let that slip away. Or if it was going to slip away, I didn't want that to be because of something I didn't do. Um, and then that experience itself, that, that six week period in my life is, is to date the, the best period uh, of my life, my wife, my life, my wife. I was thinking about my wife because don't tell my <laughs> wife because that doesn't include my wedding or my kids being born. Now that's maybe shifted my, my perspective a little bit, but seriously, like that, that experience where you come together, you understand, you recognize that you're representing the United States. You're one of the best 23 players in the whole country of 300 plus million people that will be stepping on a field in front of millions of people, billions globally and representing your team. And I think when you put it in those terms, I never thought of that as a player, but now when I've, I've had a chance to kind of reflect on my career, it's special, you know, world cups are, are special and, you know, everybody comes out of the woodworks. When we beat Algeria, Bill Clinton's in our locker room with Reggie Bush and Kobe Bryant's at our games turning up at our, you know, our after party after we lost uh, the last game and just like a surreal moment for soccer, which is growing so much in this country. And even going back 12 years ago when I was a part of it to think of where it was then to versus now and just how pop culture mainstream this World Cup is going to be once again. Like that's that's the stuff that, you know, gives you goosebumps again and uh, it makes you very proud. I don't often take moments these days to, to think back about my career because I feel that, that that's a different chapter of my life. But when I do, like the World Cup is the first thing that I come back to. And, and I really, you know, it, it is a thing when a conversation, somebody says, oh, you played soccer. Like maybe they don't know what I did. And, you know, and then I said, yeah, I, I played for the U.S. Oh, cool. Did you like what did you do? Oh, I played in a World Cup like what you played in a world cup like that's you know that's kind of the the reaction and it, it's cool to think about that i you know i checked that one off the box mm -hmm. yeah of course certain certainly something that millions of other people have not done in their lives or their careers <laughs> yeah. like i'm just happy to be going you know as a member <laughs> yeah. of the media yeah. let alone being on the field and actually playing and contributing and, and celebrating and all that so it's certainly a special moment and as i'm sure it will be for the, the 23 you know who are there representing the u.s um, you know, you talk about the growth of soccer in the U.S., and, and I, I do want to get into that. Um, but I do want to talk more about pressure in the World Cup, knowing that 
it's not only on these players representing the U.S., but it's on the coach, Greg Berhalter, too. And if I'm yeah. not mistaken, I think his contract runs out after the World Cup. So he's playing for a contract, um, yeah. you know, especially knowing 2026 is coming to North America. So just talk about, you know, wh- what are your thoughts on the job? Excuse me, the job he's done so far with the team. And how does he not focus on all that outside noise and everything knowing, hey, we need to have a good run at this World Cup or, you know, I might have to look for another job. There's a couple of things there with with Greg Berhalter. When he was appointed, I don't think he was the sexy pick. Uh, and look, he, he's an American coach. He's an American player that played in a World Cup and represented the United States. He'd coached in MLS uh, before that part. He'd coached in Europe for a period in, in Sweden. And in MLS, it had some success. But I think when the new regime came in to U.S. soccer and took over and and looked at it in a way and what went wrong in the previous cycle when we did not qualify, there were a couple things that, you know, Greg Berhalter was identified as, as he's a coach that's worked with young players. He understands the American system. He understands the American player and Europe as well. You know, having been a guy that's that's well-traveled, look, he, he, he never seems to be able to fully win over the American soccer fan base. I actually don't even know if that's possible. I, I could be like Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp. And I think still there might be, you know, a fraction of the fan base that wouldn't be happy. I, I was skeptical, skeptical at the beginning because he'd never coached a national team. He's never coached at a world cup, obviously, because this is his first time with a national team. This will be his first world cup as well. But what I will say for, for Greg and what I think he has done well in is that he came in with an idea as a coach and a couple of the things that he was doing weren't working. A couple of things were working and he was willing and able to adapt to that and change maybe some of his baseline principles. I think he's related to a young group of players really well. He's also committed and given a lot of confidence to a group at a point where you still could have had some old guys from the last cycle, like Michael Bradley, Josie Altador. But he said pretty early in that cycle, like these are the young guys we're going with. I don't care. They're 19, 20, 21. Like let's grow as a group together and let's be in a place come the world cup in 22. And then also in 26, where we feel we're going to have a really, really good team. And then in the biggest moments and the biggest challenges for this team, the gold cup this past year, they won the nation's league. They beat Mexico. They meet Mexico four times in a calendar year, which the U S had never done before. Yeah. I mean, we had the, the dose of Cerro uh, again in Cincinnati. And so like, he has stepped up and gotten this team motivated to win in the big moments. Now I still do have questions about what type of roster he's going to select coming up here in the next week. Uh, What, what is the balance of that? What is the mix of players between American uh, MLS players and then American players playing in Europe? Um, And ultimately that's where you're judged as a coach is in world cups. Like you got to a world cup. I think that was what everybody hoped and had expected. So it's not like you get a brand new contract for reaching the world cup. It's going to be based on his performance in this world cup. And if he gets this team out of the group. So I have confidence that Greg can do that. Uh, I, I think thinking about two coach cycles, like does he get a new contract that's four years through 26? Let's, let's see, because historically that hasn't worked out too well for national teams, but I, I think he's still a coach that is, motivated to do so and and i have the confidence that he can lead this group this team out of the group here coming up here in uh in wow three weeks <laughs> <laughs> yeah time flies right i can't believe it's yeah. November already it's just like man where did summer go and here we are you know like like we're talking about with the world cup coming in, in three weeks which is awesome um you know and, and you touched on it earlier too and i want to dive into this a bit more too just about the growth of soccer in the u.s you know i grew up playing soccer i'm a huge fan I knew I'd never make it as a professional, so I'm like, how can I help grow the game and write stories and and interview amazing people like you to help get the word out there just about the popularity of the sport and how much it is growing. So, you know, from from your days coming up through the ranks, you know, playing in Texas, playing at Clemson and then obviously overseas, just, you know, like how much have you seen this sport grow in the U.S.? And, you know, is it going to compete with the NFL ever? I don't know. That's really hard to say, but like, it, as, it definitely... as you've got the Joe Flacco Jersey behind you there, you know, that's... <laughs> listen, there's, there's soccer stuff back there. I got NYCFC, <laughs> Manchester United. It's all around. <laughs> but um, I, I think that's what you see though. It's, it's, it, you know, to, to your point, the, the growing of the great, the game and the introduction of new fans to the game, especially in this country. And it's, it's a big part of why I'm excited if my new partnership with, with Lotto and a, and a brand that I had an affinity to, as a kid going back to six years old, wearing their boots and 
you know, their part in my journey. And I think what I feel now and see and what has me excited about that partnership with Lotto is that they understand where soccer is, is headed in this country and the potential for growth in what is already a, a sport that has a, a rocket ship behind it with a, with a big target being 2026 and the World Cup in this country and what that is going to do as kind of that next kickoff point. I mean, let's think back to, to 1994. We, we were both alive, right? In ni- 1994, I'm not, I'm not dating myself. Were you, you're, you're not uh, pre, ni- post-94, are you? No, no, but thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> like the, the 94 World Cup and what it did for, for soccer in this country. There was no professional league. MLS didn't exist. Today, MLS has ni- 29 teams. You have a New York City uh, little pendant up there, the, you know, the defending champions. Think of all the kids now, but also the parents that were fans of those teams that now their kids are fans of those teams and just the opportunities grassroots. Like you, like many, like myself played soccer as a kid. And then you get to the point where you're 10, 11, 12 years old. You didn't necessarily have that pathway to go to the next level and to, to have the opportunity to do that. It was football. Then it was basketball because those were the guys that were making millions of dollars. And those were the sports that were for at the forefront. Now you have an opportunity. If you're a kid in LA, if you're in DC, if you're in um, New York, if you're in Houston, if you're in Austin, like the list goes on, they have professional academies. They have more opportunities for kids. There's more investment than you've ever seen for the sport of soccer in this country. And then there's also that pathway of like, Hey, I can play professionally. I can make millions of dollars. I watch these guys in my backyard. It's on TV every single weekend now in America. Actually, it's almost every single day that you could watch a game of soccer. And I think that for me is, is the exciting part and why I love you know, being able to, what is a big passion of mine is to get involved at the grassroots level. And you, you get in with these kids that when they're still forming their love for things. And I see it every week with my daughter at the local soccer field and that she's having fun with her friends. Uh, they go to games on the weekend. They talk about soccer. There's different soccer jerseys in there. And it's, it's just, it's just this huge melting pot, I think of cultures and it's very different and unique to other sports around there because it's such a global sport. And I think that's, that's what's so exciting. And the, and the growth is undeniable. You just have to, to walk down the street and you actually see kids playing soccer now instead of just playing basketball or baseball uh, with their parents. So I couldn't be more bullish on, on men's and, f- and women's soccer now heading in the next couple of years here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you and me both. And, and I think you made a good point earlier too. And I want to touch on this, just how mainstream it's gotten that you see, you know, uh, professional athletes investing in MLS, NWSL clubs. And, you know, I know you're obviously an investor uh, for, with Mallorca over yeah. in Spain. Um, so, so just talk about t- that too. And you see guys, you know, are hitting the, the Holland celebration and, and Ronaldo <laughs> and all that stuff. Like it has gotten more mainstream and kind of vice versa as well. That isn't just like, what's this kind of foreign sport that people are talking about and waking up early on Saturdays and Sundays to watch? Yeah, I, I think that's where representation matters. And I, I saw this firsthand with my daughter and that I, as a former professional soccer player, I want my kids to love soccer the way I do, but I also don't want to force it upon them. And I want that love for them to, to grow naturally in an authentic way. And my daughter, I would buy her all the cool jerseys. I would you know, have soccer on every weekend with the Premier League. And it wasn't until though the Women's World Cup in 2019 was on that she saw people that looked like her being females and ponytails and headbands and cool gear. And like, that was for her the moment where she thought like, this is something I could do. This would be cool to play on, on, uh, on TV one day. This would be cool to play in a world cup. And I think now that's why, you know, you think about this next generation of athlete that, that watch it on TV because it's so accessible, it becomes something cool. And that's something that you want to do and something that you can, you can grow your own, your own passion and love for. And exactly as you said, you have these shared experiences of watching Holland do his celebration or the Cristiano Ronaldo Sue. And, you know, now kids are doing it in the playground and, you know, I, I, that gets me excited for, I think the endless possibilities again, like that, that we have in, in my partnership now with Lotto to, to be able to kind of influence the, those next generation of athletes at the grassroots and be a part of their journey all the way through to, 
you know, that, that, that professional level, hopefully I, I would love my kids to play professional soccer. I'm not going to force them to, you better be training out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No pressure. Let's go start doing laps or something. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say with lotto too. And, you know, I, I remember just like you said, growing up, you know, you wore the boots. I had them too. You know, our school colors were blue and white and I had the all blue ones and I would, I chuffed them up so much because I kept trying to bend it like Beckham after practice. <laughs> right? I played on the right and I was like, I got to do all these free kicks and, obviously it didn't work out, but again, just how, how important is it to, to show these kids that like, there are the opportunities out there. There are the pathways. It's not just, okay, I need to go to the NFL or NBA and, or I can't play sports. Like yeah. soccer is a viable option. There are opportunities. There are resources for, you know, young boys, young girls, all that kind of stuff like that. And just how important it is, you know, aligning yourself with a brand like Lotto. You know, it, you're, you're so right in that, that experience. I think when you, uh, you put on your first pair of boots you you lace them up uh you walk around them on them in the house i have this with my daughter now with her lotto cleats where you know i'm like hey this is the only time you can wear them in the house because it's the brand new ones and once you step outside and they're caked with dirt you're not allowed to do that again but you know like that feeling of the ball and um when you put on your gear i always used to say it was uh, and i felt my best as a professional when it was uh, look good, feel good, uh, play good, right? Like I, I, I used to want to make sure that my equipment was good. My socks were the right height. My, my boots were laced up. My shin guards were in my Jersey was how I, I like, it was all just part of a vibe and, and that's your uniform. That's your, you know, that's your suit. Um, and now my suit, when I put that on, on air, like I like to feel good and it makes me, I think, perform, perform at my best. And you know, it's so important still, like I've, I've talked a lot with you already about the growth of the game and the more opportunities the, the reality is we're still not there when it comes to globally of the amount of access that you have to soccer in your local parks. And there still needs to be a concerted investment in that to continue to give kids opportunities, but opportunities in the right way. And with good coaching, um, with good experiences, with, you know, on, on a weekend at a nice field and with professional referees and, you know, that, that whole experience is part of your, your formation of your childhood. And I have such a different appreciation for that now as, as a parent and thinking back to now what my parents did for me, exactly that, you know, driving me to get my first pair of, of lotto boots when I was a kid, but then also the amount of money that they spent for me on gear, on travel, on accommodations, on opportunities to, to get to where I did. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without them. And it makes me now not just want to give back to my kids, but also an, an, another generation of, of soccer kids, because I want everybody to, to love the game in which I did, because I'm sitting here talking to you because of soccer. I'm sitting here with what I have because of soccer, like soccer has given me my whole life. And, um, I, I, I feel very fortunate in that, in that respect because now I, I get paid to talk about soccer and I, I still pinch myself that think that this is kind of a, a dream job, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. We're very, very lucky. Some more so yeah. than others, you more so than me. <laughs> <laughs> no. And it's funny. You mentioned the, the, you know, look good, feel good, play good kind of thing. I try to take that to the golf course because obviously I can't play. I don't play soccer. Yeah. What's your handicap? Before. And it just doesn't, it's, I'm not even going to put that out there. No, <laughs> I do not play, you know, uh, frequent enough to, you know, be a good golfer, but at least if I'm out there and I look good and I feel good, you know, that's all that matters. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. but let me, you know, I, I know, uh, you know, I'm sure you got a bunch of other stuff to do. And like you said, you got world cup prep coming up here. Uh, but, uh, you know, I want to just get your, your final thoughts on the tournament. You know, like, who, who, who do you think is going to win? There's so many, fav you know, favorites. Everyone thinks, oh, this is, you know, Messi's swan song with Argentina. They're going to win. And Brazil's always such a favorite. And, you know, England, like you mentioned before. So just, you know, kind of maybe, you know, who, who your thoughts are on, you know, who do you think is going to hoist the World Cup? Yeah, there, there's so many fascinating storylines coming into this one because the last couple of defending champions have gone out in the group stage, uh, Germany. And then, you know, before that it was Spain this time it's France. And I think one of the things they've done differently and better, you talked a bit about their injuries earlier, but they've reloaded with some really good young players and refreshed that squad in a different way. And also added an experienced player who happens to be the Ballon d'Or winner in Kareem Benzema. That's not a bad guy to add to your mix uh, mm -hmm. when, when it comes to a defending champion. The other exciting storylines, yeah, Messi and Ronaldo, probably their final swan song at World Cups. Neither of them have won a World Cup in their uh, careers. 
They both won international tournaments now with their countries. I think Messi comes in with one of the best supporting casts that we've seen in a long time. Not like star-studded uh, supporting casts when you think of Iguains and Agueros and Di Marias. I mean, Di Maria is going to be there, but it's now Lataro Martinez and potentially Dybala, but then a stacked defense with um, Lissandra Martinez, who's having a great season at Manchester United. So I expect them to be in the final, if not winning it. And what a story that would be for Messi. And I think we cap him as the goat um, when it comes to that. I think this could be the, the, the roaring back of South America. who have not won a world cup since 2002 when it was Brazil, Brazil are going to be stacked as they are every tournament, but I think this is their best chance they've had to win it in a long time. And then don't count out a, a team like Germany uh, who went out in the group stage last time. They have a new coach. They have a younger group. They still have the experience of guys like Thomas Muller and my most excited thing is to have the United States back and see how they do at a World Cup again. By the time they step on the field, it'll have been over eight years since we were last in a World Cup in Brazil. I hate to talk and think about that, but I also get excited about that first game, November 21st, when they're standing there, hands are on the hearts, and the national anthem's playing, and we're about to kick off against Wales and start our World Cup campaign and show the world that, you know, American soccer is, is something to be bullish about. We have some really exciting young players and yeah, that that's, uh, that, that's, that's going to be that moment. I think that American soccer fans think like, it's nice to be back with the big boys, but not just be back. Let's not be happy to be there. Let's, let's put on a show and, and let's get out of the group and, and see what happens after that.